These days, food is news. Arrímense todos. We go to the story, bring it back to our kitchen. We are making nopales fish tacos. We dig into the issues. Local food is not trendy. It's actually um, security. And serve it up. Aguacate uh, does actually mean testicles. I'm Sophia Rowe, and this is Counterspace. Much of the food we eat goes through a pretty incredible journey to get to us. This is especially true of avocados. They don't grow just anywhere. They need tons of sunlight and a ton of rain, which is why about three quarters of the world's avocados come from Mexico, mostly from the state of Michoacan. Americans are eating about three times more avocados than they did almost 20 years ago. Higher demand is good news for the Michoacan, but when a region booms, horses often much shadier aim to get in on the action. And trust me, that's part of your food's journey too. Avocados are big business in Mexico. The state of Michoacan exports the majority of them to the tune of almost $3 billion a year. Bueno, yo soy una de las personas que a mí me encanta mucho el aguacate. El, la gente aquí vive del aguacate. Locals call it green gold. Over the past 20 years, America's obsession with the avocado has driven industry profits and lifted many people here out of poverty. Last year, the United States imported a record-breaking 2.1 billion pounds of the fruit from Mexico. El oro verde, este, este era una región demasiado pobre, demasiado, este, demasiado, se puede decir, ¿verdad? And these days, mining this green gold comes at a price. Criminal organizations like the Cartel de Jalisco and Las Viagras have set their sights on the fruit as a way to diversify their illicit portfolios by extorting growers and stealing land. We're heading up to meet up with a group of people who have organized to defend this land, defend this area from cartels and criminal groups. And we're coming up to their checkpoint. You can see a guy standing out here with an M4 rifle, a sniper up there. You're gonna see people like this all over town trying to protect this community. Arrímense todos. Miren, ahorita voy a salir con los oficiales. Vamos a ir a dar un recorrido de de prevención del delito, vamos a ver que nuestras, nuestros linderos estén bien. Hector Tata Saavedra is the commander of a local defense group that rose up against the Knights Templar cartel when it tried to take over large swaths of Michoacan's avocado orchards in 2013. Inicialmente nos, nos defendimos con machetes, con palos, con piedras. Cerramos los accesos a nuestras comunidades, les cerramos. Nadie sale y nadie entra. Esa fue nuestra mejor defensa. El día de hoy, pues, estamos un poquito diferentes. Cierren el convoy a unos 50 metros cada, cada vehículo, por favor. En ese aspecto, es el mero corazón de la zona aguacatera. El crimen organizado está alrededor nuestro. Ha habido excepciones en las que sí hemos tenido emboscadas. Pues es nuestra labor seguir haciéndolo. Last year, Tata and his men found themselves in a firefight with members of the Cartel de Jalisco. The shootout lasted close to an hour. The cartel gunmen eventually retreated, but not before Tata and his men captured one of their wounded. Juan. When Tata and his team head out on patrol, it's people like Virgilio Augustine Serrano, a local farmer turned tower guard, who mans the checkpoints. How often do you eat rabbit? <clears throat> Solamente cuando vienen los gringos a visitarnos. 
What kind of attention did the avocado industry bring to this community? Éramos un pueblo, digamos, rezagado, pero a partir de la llegada de la producción de aguacate, el pueblo ha ha sobresalido y se ha estado desarrollando, pues. So are these avocados ready to cut? Este va a estar listo para cortar a principios de de diciembre. A hectare of land produces roughly 20 tons of avocados, and at 40 pesos a pop, a farm like Virgilio's can rake in some $23,000 per harvest. There's a lot, a lot of people in the U.S. that love these things, but I don't think they realize what all of Michoacan goes through to not only harvest them, but to keep you and the community safe from the cartels and criminal groups. What's your message to them to remember when they eat an avocado? Eh, el aguacate cuesta mucho trabajo producirlo y no nada más eh, eh, trabajo, sino cuesta organización, cuesta sangre en algunos eh, vidas, en algunos casos. Eh, no demeriten nuestro aguacate, eh, consuman nuestro aguacate y tengan la seguridad que es un aguacate de calidad y que está producido por manos mexicanas, michoacanas e indígenas. So when's the last time you actually got to enjoy one? Y hoy por la mañana me comí un aguacate. Eh, soy un consumidor de aguacate, consumo mi propio aguacate eh, y lo consumo diario. This will definitely be the freshest piece of avocado I've ever eaten. Cheers. It's good. It's very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bueno. Yeah, bueno. I don't know if I should eat this whole thing, though. I am allergic. <laughs> <laughs> For you personally, what are you protecting? Mira, yo personalmente protejo mi familia. Esta es la práctica que hacemos normalmente. Are you afraid that things will go back to the way they were? Puede que llegue a estar las cosas igual. Eh, que esperemos que no, pero pues sí, o sea, tenemos, el miedo es latente, o sea, siempre está, nos ha estado acompañando. Por eso, precisamente por el miedo es que decidimos organizarnos, si no, pues no hubiéramos organizado nada. I actually went to Mexico on a solo trip for three weeks, and I ate more nopales tacos than I cared to admit. So today, we are making nopales fish tacos. I am just over the moon excited about this because not only is it super, super simple, but it's also one of those things that once you have, you're just gonna want over and over and over again. The particular cactus we're using, that nopal, there's 114 different species. And Mexico allots 7 million acres to growing nopal cactus. It just lets you know how important nopales is in Mexican cuisine. The first step, we're gonna make corn tortillas. Don't let that intimidate you because corn tortillas only have three ingredients. It's basically masa, water, salt, party time. This is exactly what we want. So I'm actually gonna get it out of this bowl now. So this is the texture that I love. So you see how it doesn't stick to my hands, but it's still nice and sticky? All right, so we are going to press our tortillas. So you wanna make sure you have a barrier. You wouldn't just wanna take your masa dough and pop it right on the press, right? Because it would stick, right? And you also wanna make sure you have a barrier here. So we're gonna use two pieces. We are gonna take a nice little ball of our masa. You do not have to use a tortilla press. You can absolutely just use the back of any flat pan. And we're gonna just plop this baby right in the center. Parchment paper on top. Beautiful. Press it down. Gorgeous. Amazing. She's a cutie, right? So I've got a griddle, it's about, about medium high heat. And just drop her down. Oh, gorgeous. And we're just gonna plop this baby on. Awesome. So you see this golden brown? That's what we want. So, we are gonna get them off the heat. We are gonna head into our next step, which of course is the fabulous nopales. You're gonna love it. 
Are you guys ready to see our nopal cactus? They're so fabulous. When you are shopping for nopales at the grocery store or the market, you want to look for bright, bright green. These are a younger cactus and they're much more tender in flavor. I'm gonna talk to you about how to cut and prep. Listen, we're dealing with cacti, okay? There's thorns. So first thing I suggest, if there are any thorns near the end, this portion, you wanna make sure you take those off or you could use a little paper towel so that you can kind of hold on to it. And you can get in there and get those thorns off. You don't want to cut in. You want to cut, you want to just sort of graze the outside. You just want to make sure you get those thorns and those knobs. These little ends here, if they're really hard, you can just cut that off. This is extremely similar to aloe in texture. Now, we're gonna cook that slime off, so you're not gonna have to worry about it. We are gonna actually dice this up because we're using it for a salsa. We've got a pot of super salty boiling water, and we are gonna drop this cactus right in there. Now, the cactus will finish cooking in about 10 or 15 minutes. However, it'll still be extremely slimy. So it's important to let it cook for at least 30 minutes. We have a little baking soda here. So a little baking soda right at the beginning, and then a little baking soda right at the end of cooking. So when there's only about five minutes left, will also help with the sliminess. I actually already have some finished nopales right here. So we're gonna toss that in. We're building our salsa here. We also have some charred corn, tomatoes, some Thai chilies here, and we also have some cubanelle peppers. If you wanted an equivalent to a cubanelle, like say you can't find a cubanelle, a poblano would be a lovely, lovely choice. So we are going to stir our salsa up. This is an excellent moment for some salt. We're also gonna come in here with some lime, why not? No salsa is complete without cilantro. Here, I have got some halibut and salt, also pepper. We'll season the other side once we put it on the heat. We've got a grapeseed oil. If you want to use vegetable or canola oil, that's perfectly fine too. And we're just gonna take our fish straight to the pan. Three minutes each side. I'm also gonna take a lime and just right on the heat. And that charred lime flavor is gonna blow your mind. The nopales, the charred lime, the fish, the homemade corn tortilla. Like, what else do you need? I can't wait to take a bite of this. Oh, I can't, I'm just going in. All right, I'm going in, okay? Mm. Mm, mm, mm. That nopales is so good. Also these, Nothing quite beats a fresh corn tortilla. Yum. Down the hatch. Mm. Since the pandemic began, Danielle Schwab, an economist turned business owner, has made it her mission to help people understand where exactly their food comes from. What makes a young person decide, you know what I want to go to college for? Economics. I was just fascinated by how, how things get to us. How do things travel? How do we buy things in the supermarket? Where did it come from? How are these goods made? And it ultimately led me to a job combating counterfeit goods. But it exposed me to global supply chains, and that is basically how things are made in the aggregate places where stuff comes together along the supply chain. And I learned how disaggregated it was and how companies don't even know where their inputs come from. I really think about, especially in America, how much is imported. When you're in the store, it doesn't resonate. You don't make that connection with the quality and where something's grown and, and the person who grew it or the place that it came from. It's yes. just completely divorced from that and, and anonymous. This has become a situation where it makes no difference where food comes from. And we now have, it's actually cheaper to buy food from China than it is from your own state. In my business, I had a box of kale that I was giving to my customers and someone in my warehouse asked me how much it was and he's in the kale chip business and he laughed at me because it was more expensive to buy from New Jersey growers 
than it was the kale that he gets from China. And that is like, it just doesn't add up. No. It doesn't add up. It's so funny when you think about supply chain and especially su sustainability. I think we hear it a lot in fashion, but with food, I don't know what. Nowhere. It's strange, and I always think about it. It's fashion, and there's low waste, yes. the zero waste communities, and there's some weird gap where it's just <sighs> no one's talking about food and, and how food is made, and it's yes. come up in COVID with the problems in supply and demand and people going hungry. It's, it's, it's an issue, and it's all supply chain distortions, and consumers do have a responsibility to pay attention to both. But I am a firm believer that it can't, everybody can't vote with their fork and you know you can't make all those decisions. So it has to be a little bigger than that and we have to kind of look to policy to, to fix a lot of this as well. There is a possibility to do better when you get direct. Take out the 100 middlemen okay. that, where the supply chains are right now, passes hands so many times you lose track. That's the beginning of my career, was just watching counterfeits pass hands so many times you lost track of the origins, same right. with food. So if you can take out a lot of those steps, which is what I'm trying to do with my business, then you can have a lot more yes. say yes. in what you're promoting to your customers. Well, let's talk about your business because this is this is really what we need to be focusing on if we really want to make changes here, yep. is really this like regional eating. People who were interested in supporting local, actually when it came down to it, had no way to do it. So I was thinking, you know, what can I do? I was like, well, maybe I can just try and bring it to people. And naively, I was like, I'll just go around to farms and pick up. Not possible. Fresh food is really challenging, and it's hard for the farmers, it's hard for the grocery stores, it goes bad, you know, it is it is tough. Everything comes down to logistics and distribution. So I luckily found a distributor who works with farms in the region, maintains the transparency there, so you know the farm where everything's coming from, and I put together farm boxes and deliver them. So I try and work with a chef to make recipes, let's use all the food. Let's put a specialty product in, make it exciting. So it's not just like actual produce that's in there? No, it's produce, milk, eggs, cheese, fresh bread, and a wow. specialty product. It's fun. What people need to remember is that local food is not trendy. It's actually um, security yes. for our area. If there's a spike on gasoline or if there's a trucking issue, we're not gonna have food here because the food gets trucked in. Right. So you, you sh people should be concerned aside from the environmental impact of just, is there literal food right yes. around me to eat? Like no matter how much money you have, like if imports are closed and we don't have regional food systems, we're actually in trouble, everybody. Yes. So supporting local food right now is bigger than just it's the right thing to do. I mean, right. you actually need growers in your area who can sustainably provide. Okay, wait, how did the avocado, a fruit that only grows in just a few places, end up on every freaking menu? Cue the origin story. Up until recently, even the grocery stores mislabeled it as H-A-A-S avocados. It rhymes with class, but it also rhymes with pass as past the guacamole. You just have to think of your posterior and put an H in front of it. And that seemed to solve the, the pronunciation from then on. Because I am a historian of the Haas avocado, it's, it's very important for this history to be corrected. Oh yeah, there's the green gold, baby. Aguacate uh, does actually mean testicles. The word itself was a mouthful for um, the growers. <laughs> Avocado stuck because the other was not so appealing when you're trying to sell something that's edible. My name is Gina Rose Kimball, and I'm the Haas Avocado Historian. There are over 400 varieties of avocados. Uh, the most popular avocado throughout the world is the Haas variety. The family member's proud of their name. They're obviously fans of the avocado. Um, some of them adorn that, some on their license plate of their vehicles. Oh, I love avocados. My favorite is uh, breakfast is just uh, toast and avocado. It's Haas or Haas, and I you know Haas just like the avocado. And oh yes, I like that. And I said, well, that was my grandfather's. You can thank me. And he loved to uh, dabble in growing things. There was this one seed that supposedly was from Central America or South America uh, that grew into the Haas mother tree. My grandfather wanted to cut it down because he didn't see 
you know, the purpose of the, the uh, ugly black skin fruit that was coming off of it. Uh, they all mutinied and said no way. They wanted to keep the tree and, and thankfully he, uh, he did and uh, turned out to, to be quite a find. To the avocado. Rudolph made an agreement with Harold Brokaw to exclusively propagate and sell and promote his Hass tree. Rudolph made less than $4,800. To today, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. This is where Hank Brokaw's ashes are buried forever in the stump of this oak tree. He planted, you know, this whole ranch. Every once in a while, you get some salacious story about hundreds of thousands of dollars in avocados, stolen, grand theft avo. What starts as a little hole in a fence can turn into, uh, you know, a bigger issue down the road. Our main line of defense is our security gates down by the main entrance, but we rely on a lot of perimeter fencing as well. We never know where, where people could come from. You know, it's, for me, avocados help define the whole landscape of California. Neighbors that have avocado groves and recognize our, you know, our heritage, so they give us free avocados. Rudolph Hass was a history maker. People might not know how to pronounce the name properly all the time, but they definitely know that that's their choice of avocado.